We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams, yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities, and out of a fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream, a pleasure, can go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample an empire down. We in the ages lying in the buried past of the earth, built Nineveh with our sighing, and Babel itself with our mirth, and overthrew them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth. For each age is a dream that is dying, or one that is coming to birth. That poem was owed by Arthur O'Shaughnessy, and it's one of my absolute favorites to recite, and not just because of the clear, crisp meter and rhyme, I really love its theme, or my interpretation of its theme, which is that humanity as a whole and us as individuals have nearly limitless potential to do great things, good or bad. Poetry, I believe, is uniquely suited to conveying deep philosophical topics like this and the depth and breadth of the human experience. This is because poetry has layers, like an onion, and lots of them. We have the specific words and how they interact in their lines and their stanzas. And then you have how they interact with the overall poem as a whole, how the words interact with each other. Then you have layers of subtext and inference that the author might want you to get or think about. And then you have the devices that the author uses. And all of these pull together to communicate the theme, to help the author express themselves. But it can be daunting to even try and build your own poem or to interpret other people's. There are a couple of different ways that you can express yourself with poetry. One of them is that you can record a memory or an event that you don't want to forget. One of them is that you can try and work through the emotions you're feeling at a certain situation or just something you're feeling. It can help you figure out, actually, what you're feeling. Or you can try and step into someone else's shoes, into a situation that you've never been in, but you want to kind of explore. Poetry can help with that, too. But it's uniquely suited for these things because of the many layers which you can add. You can not only say what you want to say, but you can add those extra emotions and inferences behind it. So let's see some of this in action. Poetry is enrapturing if you know what to look for and how to interpret it. I'm going to try and give you the tools, some of them, that you need to unwind poetry and look at it in depth to help you unravel its nuances and gasp at the beautiful complexity of its weaving. I can dream, right? So I have four of these devices. Theme, word choice, symbolism, and length. And even if I'm focusing on one, you'll notice that I often refer to the others because they build with each other to complete the poem. Theme. Theme is basically the central idea of the poem that I'm referring to as the theme. It can be an emotion, something that you realized the other day that you want to communicate to your audience, a moral lesson, or just an experience that you want to record, something as banal as the sunset that you saw five minutes ago. That's perfectly fine, too. But one of the most important things about theme is that poetry is a very condensed medium. You don't want to have a lot of filler because when you're really analyzing poetry in depth, it will distract the audience from what really is the theme. So every word that you write, you want to be centered and focused around the theme. Let's see this in action. Will a clock ever be real to us until time ends? 
Similarly, can a cemetery truly exist before we are immortal? Only once past their utility may these entities be perceived. We would see them then for the first time as them and not the medium we made of them. That's by not. And so the word choice and all the devices in this pull together to make the theme. But this can be daunting and we may not know the theme, you know, the first time we read it, that rarely ever happens. So let's go back and try to figure it out. You'll see in the last sentence, we would see them then for the first time as them and not the medium we made of them. He comes so close to actually stating the theme, but not really. It's deceptively simple here. We have to combine that sentence with what he was saying for the rest of the poem. So let's go back. So we have some objects here that are probably symbolism. And those are the ones at the beginning. If a poem talks about a couple of objects, it's either referring to connotations that you usually attach to the object, or the object is standing in for something else, and that would be symbolism. So clock and the cemetery are really the symbols here. We have a lot of time words. Clock, time, cemetery, immortal, once, past. That is going to be important to the poem as a whole, identifying those themes throughout it, or those motifs. Um, so what could clock and cemetery be standing in for? We have to look at things that, we, we have to look at all of the symbols together to really get this. So, what is he saying about clocks and cemeteries? We notice that he's talking about time running out and cemeteries. So because of these things, I think he's talking about death here, or at least nearing death. And then we come upon, um, so that is what those are representing, past and utility. So we have to consider what are clocks and cemeteries used for, to measure time until we run out of it. And then when we run out of it, we go to the cemetery. And then he says, we would see them then for the first time as them and not the medium we made of them. Well, what are time and clocks and cemeteries mediums for? This is where you get even more into interpretation than we already were. So. What are they associated with and how can you interpret that? I choose to interpret this as clocks and cemeteries being associated with death. So what, can, what is associated with death as a medium that once we don't have any use for it anymore, only once past their utility can they be perceived? And when you're immortal, you have no use for death anymore. You have no use for clocks and cemeteries because you don't need them. And that is why he uses those devices to illustrate his points. We would see them for the first time as them and not the medium we made of them. We can read into this deeper by seeing, by choosing to interpret um, layers of clock and cemetery. We associate these with emotions about death usually negative ones. But once we're immortal and we don't have any use for them anymore, we shed those emotions. We can see them objectively for the first time as them and not the medium we made of them. We can lose those emotions. And so not uses his poem, his word choice and symbolism and how uh, the two parts of the poem relate to each other to convey the theme. Now this is actually an excerpt from the poem but this is the whole overall theme of the poem. Okay, so symbolism. Symbolism and metaphor are two devices that are very closely related. But symbolism is a step beyond metaphor. Metaphor is just representing one object or idea with another. Whereas symbolism, the object that you represent the other one with, has a specific context and deeper meaning to it that you also add to the thing you're representing. So when you choose a symbol, you want to be very deliberate about what you choose because that meaning will also attach itself with what you're representing. 
Let's see this in action. In the spring, I asked the daisies if his words were true, and the clever, clear-eyed daisies always knew. Now the fields are brown and barren, bitter autumn blows, and of all the stupid asters, not one knows. Let's start with word choice here, because that will help us narrow down the symbolism. Daisies and flowers are the two main objects of the poem, or asters, they're both flowers, are the two main objects of the poem. So we want to see what those could represent. There are two um, very clear parts of the poem. One of them is more positive, you know, and the other is more negative, like barren. So let's see what words are associated with daisy in the first part. Spring, daisies, clever, clear-eyed, always. You draw those together, what do they have in common? And you look at them. Okay. And then they're positive, they have connotations of youth. So, I believe that youth is represented by daisies in this poem. If we go on to the second part, pick out the words there that could tell us what asters represent. Brown, barren, bitter, blows, stupid, not one. All of those have negative connotations, connotations of almost time is over. So I believe that asters here are representing like, you know, time running out or nearing death. Stupid is also an interesting word choice here, you'll notice, because that doesn't fit in with the rest of the words in the poem. But you can read into that as well. Um, and this is an important part of poetry analysis, is noticing um, what the poem is like and then any oddities in it. So stupid, well, time is running out. So the narrator right, might be running out of time to pick their words carefully. Also, this could indicate frustration at the asters, you know. Have you ever called someone like a stupid head, I mean, when you were a little child, um, because you were frustrated at them? So the narrator might be frustrated that their time is running out. And so here you can read a little deeper into the poem. And then, so the metaphors, the symbolism, and the word choice pull together the poem around the theme of youth and dying and like decaying in that process. Okay, word choice. This is probably one of the most important devices you will use in poetry ever. There are a couple of things you need to do when you're developing your own skill with poetry. One of those is to spend a lot of time with it because poetry is like a language and you have to decode it and learn how to write it well. So you need to spend a lot of time with it, developing your style. Um, you should probably also get critiques and incorporate them into your work. But word choice is one of the most important because words not only have their literal meanings, but they also have subtext and connotation. You know, what you associate with a word beyond its dictionary definition, positive or negative. So let's see how this can impact a poem. I would that I were alive again to kiss the fingers of the rain, to drink into my eyes the shine of every slanting silver line, to catch the fresh and fragrant breeze from drenched and dripping apple trees. This one is by Malay. Um, so you get this um, feeling that the narrator is just astounded at the feeling that you can have when you're alive and they're kind of mourning what they can't do. But then they also describe the feeling of being alive as so amazing with these words like kiss, fingers, drink, shine, slanting silver line, freshened, fragrant, drenched, and dripping. All of these have positive connotations that really add to Malay's conveyance that it's amazing to be alive. I wish I had treasured it when I was. Length. Length is interesting. Let's just go on and see. This poem is called History by Not. Hope, Goose Step. 
Length can have a couple of different very big impacts on a poem. So if a poem is long, it has more room for filler words. And I talked about how those were kind of like not necessarily shouldn't be there. Small poems allow you to condense a lot of your theme into a very little amount. This is an extreme case, but short poems necessitate that you go through the word choice and read deeply into the connotations of the words to try and expand what they're talking about and interpret. This one has only two words, and I included the title because it's very important to put it into context, whereas the other titles aren't, weren't so important to the context. So let's start with hope. Hope has a positive connotation of bated breath, waiting for something good to happen. <sighs> let's also analyze the punctuation here because it's a very important part of the poem. We don't have much to work with. The ellipsis, the three periods, could represent time passing. Um, you know, when you use it in essays, when you're quoting, that usually indicates that you're skipping some of the quoted lines. And then we move on to Gustep. What the heck not? I love him, but he invents words a lot. You, in invented words like this, you have to just take basically anything you can get. So let's consider the sound of it and what you think when you hear the word. Goose step. I don't know, to me that kind of indicates a stumble, something that's not quite right, um, or a failure. So let's consider all of these things in the context of history. History is a cycle, so we start out with hope, and time passes, and then it fails. Something fails again. So not is really conveying, and guys, I had to sit down with this poem like five times, countless minutes, to try and work out what he was meaning here. But this is like the one thing that I could think of. Um, so he's conveying his theme that history, things are looking good until something inevitably fails again. Tragedy catches up with us. And that's what he's trying to convey. And that was very helped by his length in this poem because he was able to just state succinctly a few words and you had to read into it a lot. But he still maybe got everything that he wanted to across. If you inferred enough and everything, poetry is hard. Um, so all of these devices combine to really make poetry what they are. And you have to interpret them all to really maybe understand what a poem is saying. This is not a comprehensive list of devices. Oh no, you can go off and read your own. Um, but I hope that even if you just have to use it in class to try and get an assignment over with, that you learn something and that Poetry can be a really amazing device um, with lots of different layers. And as a poet, it would be amazing if someone read my work and read into it and interpreted it and then took it out into the world with fresh eyes and tried to apply it in their life or just thought about it. So I hope that I taught you a couple things about poetry and that you can appreciate it a little more. Thank you.